Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, I think I'll start in verse 13. All right, you got it. Say, I got it. Let's get to it. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Anybody got the Holy Ghost? Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I'm going to say all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his power, according to the working of his power. Just kind of seems like through that verse 19, Paul's, pretty acquainted with the power of God. I just noticed that while I was reading it. You know, the word can speak to you just, you know, seems like he's pretty acquainted with, 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 with the power of God. Yeah? <laughs> no, I literally just saw that. It's interesting. I'm uh, going to pick up here. We're in our series of Glorious Church. Amen. And, and just want to um, speak a little bit from the thought this morning. This evening, prayer that changes everything. Thanks, Pastor Don. I mean, my wife's sitting right beside you, but thanks, thanks, Pastor Don. It's good to see my wife back in the house. Y'all know the kids started back to school, and she hadn't been here. I've been shouting you out all week, every week, baby girl, so it's good to see you. Prayer that changes everything. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you speak, Lord. Lord, we're in such need of a word, Father, from you. Your church is in an hour, God, where we need to hear your voice. Your people, God, are in a time, God, where we, we need to hear from you, God. Some of us knowingly and some of us unknowingly, Father, we need your word. And so, Lord, I ask, God, that you would speak through me on tonight, God, and continue to, to build us up, Father, that we may be your instrument here in the earth, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. New York Times bestselling author Ed Millett wrote in his book, The Power of One More, four misconceptions about self-confidence and identity. He suggests that when recognized and resolved, an individual's quest for a new identity can be realized. The first identity misconception simply says, I am what I possess. I am what I, what I, what I possess. This is the individual whose identity is wrapped up in what's in their driveway, maybe wrapped up in what they wear, they feel the best about themselves when they have things in their life. The challenge with that is that when they lose those things, they lose their life. All of us have picked up the paper or saw something on the, 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 the computer screen that popped up around a CEO or an executive, a business leader, someone taking their life due to some type of financial loss. So the first misconception is, 
I am what I possess. The second misconception simply says, I am my accomplishments. I am my, uh, my accomplishments. And this individual's identity is simply wrapped up in what they achieve. Their ego is wrapped up in what they achieve. So as long as um, they have a, a certain job, as long as they have a, a certain ministry, they feel good about themselves. But, but, but this can also lead to a place of depression. You can lose that job or you can lose that, that ministry. And this can definitely be detrimental in, in the house of God. It's dangerous when uh, people get in position in God's house. People get in position and they uh, unfortunately can get microphones in their hand or be on certain platforms and, and, and they feel as if their identity is solely wrapped up in what they accomplish. That's the second misconception. The third misconception around identity simply says, I am what people say I am. I am what people say I am. And this person's identity is solely tied to how people affirm them and what people think about them. The unfortunate thing about that is if you live long enough, you'll learn that people will turn on you. I can't hear nobody on tonight. People, pe people will change on you. People will be with you in one season of your life, and they'll celebrate you, and they're your friend on one day, and they're liking all your posts on social media, and they're your best friend, but then there will come a season in your life where they just turn on you. And if your identity is wrapped up in how people feel about you and what people say about you, the moment those people are no longer in your life, all of a sudden you don't know who you are. You, you, you test those people by responding to them using one word, and that's simply no. The, the, the first time you tell them no, you'll begin to see if they're a friend of yours or not, if they're really in your corner. Your identity should never be wrapped up in what people say about you. And the fourth misconception here is that my identity is, is wrapped up in how I look. Mm, my identity is wrapped up in how I look. And, and we see this now than we've ever seen it before. I mean, just, just, just growing body parts overnight. And there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with look, wanting to look a certain way. And, 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 and we all like to look a certain way. We all have a certain style. We all like to look good. But, 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 but beauty fades. Beauty, beauty can fade. And I know you won't admit it, but you've scrolled up through and down social media before, and you, you, you saw somebody that, 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 that you were cool with back in the day, maybe high school or college or you know, the church that you went to, and all of a sudden you, you were scrolling up and down, and you said to yourself, what happened to them? They didn't look like this 20 years ago. But your identity should never be wrapped up in how you look. And we as the, the, the body of Christ, we as the church, we as God's people, we know that our identity should be wrapped up in Christ. Our identity is found in God. It's not in the things that we have or the things that we don't have. It's not wrapped up in the job that we have or the job that we don't have, the possessions. It, it, it's in Christ. And, 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 and I know we do it often, but it's always good to rehearse the genesis of how we were created and, and what God's intention was with us. I got good news for each and every one of you who are under the sound of my voice that you are an original. You are an original. And as scripture makes it clear that we were made in the image of God and in his likeness. Someone would say, well, then we're, 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 we're a copy of him. And that, that could be fine, too. I heard it once say, it's okay if you want to copy somebody as long as you know the right cat to copy. Amen. And the scripture says here in Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 27, then God said, let us make man in our image. We're talking about identity according to our likeness. Let us have dominion, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created man, created him male and female. He created them. You are an original. And there will never be another person on this earth that is you. God made you special. God made you with significance. He made you in his image, and our identity is in God. Someone say amen. Amen. Psalms 139, verse 13 through 16 simply reads, Paul, I mean, David is speaking here. He said, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. He said, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. I think sometimes we just need to thank God for the way that we made us. Some of us don't like ourselves. Mm, But God made us the way that he made us for a reason. David says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, only a marvelous God can create something in the dark. I think that's worth an amen right there. He said, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out every single day before a single day had passed. I I, I think it's important for us to understand that God might know something about us. God might know something about you that you don't know about yourself. God might have some intel. God may have some information regarding you because he made you in his image, I think God might know something about me. I I can't speak for you, but I feel like God might know something about me, and that gives me good news. Paul gets in on this conversation concerning identity. Paul comes into the kingdom of God. We know the story in Acts chapter 9 where Paul was knocked off of the horse, and, and Jesus comes to him, and Paul is ushered into the kingdom of God. And so Paul, he comes into the church, and he immediately gets to work. But I, I want to help somebody here who may be struggling with their identity. Galatians 1, 15 through 17. And this is Paul speaking. This is significant here. Paul is referencing his, 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 his journey and, 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 and his entrance into the church or into the kingdom of God. He says, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So Paul has this new identity in Christ, and watch the language he said, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Paul did not rely on man to tell him who he was. He got a revelation from God, his calling into his apostleship, this new identity that the apostle Paul received. He did not receive that from man, but watch the language. He said, I did not immediately confer with man. That does not mean that Paul did not sit up under and get trained. He was trained under Gamaliel. That scripture makes that very clear. But what you have to understand is that when you come into the kingdom of God, when when God puts his hand on you and you receive your new identity, you cannot wait for man to, 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 to validate that. God will validate that in your spirit, and God will use a man to confirm that. As you saw in Scripture, they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas, and they confirmed them, and they pushed them into the work that the Lord had called them to do. But Paul says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. I didn't go to my father. I didn't go to my mother. I didn't go to my brother or to my sister to say, what do you think about me? I didn't go to to, to, to my boss to say, what do you think about me? What do you think about this assignment or this vision or this thing that God has placed in my spirit? Paul said, 
I did not confer with flesh and blood. And I've come to tell you on tonight that your identity is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to, to, to vacillate between two opinions and you don't have to seek out others to validate what God has called you to. Amen. And so Paul goes further here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. We're talking about this new identity that we come into when we are born again through Christ Jesus. Paul speaking here, he says, for, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. For I was circumcised when I was eight years old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there was ever one, I'm a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was zealous. I, he says, I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Watch this in verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable, but I considered them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the, to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord for his sake. I have discarded everything else, counting them all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Paul says, I have this new identity in Christ Jesus. It is no longer connected to the clique that I used to be a part of. It's no longer connected to my previous job. It's no longer connected to my earthly family lineage. Paul says, I have this new identity in Christ Jesus, and the things that used to seem valuable to me are no longer valuable because my identity is wrapped up in him. It's not wrapped up in stuff. Even at one point, Paul said, I've learned to be a base. I've learned to be a bound. I can be content in whatever season I'm in because I understand that my, my, my identity is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And the church has to move into a season where we know that our identity is in him. It's not in politics. It's not in the sphere of influence that we're used to being in. It's in Christ Jesus who is the same savior of our soul. Can I get an amen? Y'all don't mind if we talk about identity a little bit this evening, do you? And so Jesus, 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 Jesus in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3, we know that Jesus is, 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 is baptized and Jesus, it, he comes up out of the water and, and, and the Father speaks from heaven. It says that, 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 that the Spirit of God came upon him and his Father spoke unto him that he was well pleased. At this moment, there was a new identity that, 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 that Jesus came into while he was on earth. And the Father made it very clear that this is my son whom I'm well pleased. When you go down to uh, chapter 4 verse 17 it makes it very clear that there was a connection between his new identity and the assignment that he had on the earth. The scripture says in chapter 4 verse 17 from that time Jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so God the Father validates Jesus' identity here on earth. And then we see something shift in, 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 in the spirit. It says from that time. From that moment, Jesus began to preach, or in other words, Jesus began to walk in a certain aspect of his purpose and his calling in the earth. From that time, from that time, from that moment that his identity was validated by God the Father, from that time he began to walk into his purpose. I wonder if you're hearing it this evening, church. See, what happens is when you know who you are in God, there is an anointing for now that comes on your life. It's interesting, Pastor Don, we were talking about this in communion the other day. I believe that we are in a season of now. 
But that now season is connected to us understanding who we are in God in this new identity that, the, that God has placed on us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus comes up out of the water. His father validates that he is his son. And immediately from that time, from that moment forward, Jesus began to walk in the assignment that God placed on him. And I've come to convince somebody on tonight that you have to accept and receive the new identity that has been placed on you because you will find purpose and you will find what God has planned for you to do in that new identity. And so there is a now anointing that is coming on the church right now. It's now is the time to walk in your purpose. Now is the time to walk into your destiny. For some of you, now is the time to start that business. For some of you, now is the time to go back the school. Now is the time and the anointing that comes on you is an anointing that comes on you because you've stepped into this new identity. Somebody say amen. amen. And so once you know who you are in God, once you know who you are and you walk in your identity, you become a weapon in the kingdom of God. And you become a threat to the kingdom of darkness. I said you become a weapon in the kingdom of God. And you become a threat to the kingdom of darkness because you have information that God wants to disseminate here in the earth. I'm, I'm a movie fan. My favorite actor is Denzel Washington. And there's a movie called Safe House. And in that movie, Denzel gets his hands on some intel. And the moment he got his hands on that intel, all hell broke loose in his life because he got some information that the enemy knew that if that information got out, it would be bad for them. I'm telling you on tonight, some of you just need to take a step into your new identity because there is some information that God wants to get to you. That's why things seem to be breaking out in your life and it feels like all hell is breaking loose. It's because the enemy understands that you have intel. The enemy understands that you have information that God wants to get into the earth. And if he can kill, steal, and destroy, he can stop you in your tracks. But the spirit of the living God would say unto you that you shall live out all the days of your life and you shall not die a premature death and that you shall be protected because you walk in a new identity and you have special intel and God wants to do something through you in the earth. And so you become... You become a weapon, you become a weapon, you become a weapon. You become a weapon. And so, and so we, have to, we have to stand up and we have to throw our shoulders back and we have to declare that I am who God says I am. And we have to confess that I will be all God said I will be. Amen, amen, amen. And so, and so there's this new identity. That, that, that has come upon the church, this revelation of this identity that the Apostle Paul has been, has, has, has been, has been expounding upon to the church of Ephesus. It's interesting, we, we, we were talking about this in the back, we're, 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 we're reading Ephesians, and even as Paul is writing, Paul is writing from a wealth of wisdom and a wealth of revelation. And God has shared some things with him concerning the church and concerning our individual identity. And so Paul has been expounding on this and we've been walking through the scripture and, 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 our new, and in this new identity in Christ, we have learned that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. Amen. We've been positioned in Christ in this new identity. We've been, we've been chosen by God, even before the foundation of the world, the scripture tells us that before you could even mess up, God chose you. We've been adopted by our Father. We've been, we've been redeemed into this, this, this new identity. We have an inheritance in God, and we've been given this guarantee. We've been given this guarantee, which is the Holy Spirit. And so Paul now would have been gone from, from Ephesus probably five or six years at the time. He's on house arrest, and there's this explosion of revelation 
that comes to him. But now when we pick up here in verse 15, we see that Paul is getting information uh, to, sent to him concerning the church in Ephesus. And so he, it, the scripture says here in, in verse 15, he says, Therefore, I, I also, after I heard of your faith, in the Lord Jesus. And I think this probably made the apostle smile because as a father, he's hearing about this church that he planted and all the time that he spent there with those leaders and how he poured out amongst those elders and all the people who, 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 who were delivered and all the people who were set free. And Paul is saying, he said, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. I think this is very important because Paul is hearing that the church is bearing fruit. Mm, ah, we got to talk about that for a minute. Paul is hearing that the church is bearing fruit. He said, I, I, I heard of your faith. And I think it's a sad day when we can walk down the street or go into the grocery store and, and, and people can say to us that they never heard about our church. You might not like how we praise. You might not like how I preach. You might not like that we baptize in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. You might not like all of that, but I'd hate the fact that I'd hate to hear that you never heard of us. Hmm. Mm -hmm. you, might not, you might not like how we dress. Some of y'all might not like I got a ball cap on, but I, 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 that's okay. That's okay. But it's a real problem when they say we never heard. We, did, we, we, we hadn't heard about your church. It's a, it's a problem that we can be saved 10, 15, and 20 years, and, and your neighbors don't know. They've never heard that you were saved. They never heard of a testimony or what God has done in your life. And the apostle Paul is saying here, I, 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 I also heard of your love for Jesus Christ. He's hearing that the church is growing. He's hearing that there's fruit, and I think that there should, be, there should be fruit in every church. And so Paul is excited because one of the things he understands is that there's this vertical relationship that the church has with the, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we should insert an amen right there. And so Paul is excited. He's happy that he's hearing that the church is in love with Jesus. It's a sad day when we do church, but we don't love Jesus. And so Paul, he's happy. He's happy here. The interesting thing about this is where, where this is put in the text, this almost would have been like his commendation. It would have been his greeting, but it's flipped around to where when you get to verse 15, Paul's actually doing an extended greeting here. It's inserted in, into a spot where he's really sprinkling revelation. I really believe, Pastor Patrick, he was so excited about all the revelation God was giving him, he just started writing. He just started writing and just started writing, and he split his greetings up. So he goes back, and he says, I, I, I've been hearing about your faith and your love for Jesus, and, and, and that's, a, that's an exciting thing. And then he goes, and he also says, and your love for all the saints, and your love for all the saints. This is a beautiful combination here. We, we, we love Jesus, and, and, and we love all the saints. I got a buddy of mine, uh, Bishop Aaron Marble, who, who pastors Jefferson Baptist Church in Tennessee, and their church model is love by Christ to love like Christ, to love by Christ, to, 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 to love by Christ. And so it's a beautiful thing that, that we can see that the church loves Jesus and, and, and there's love for all the saints. I'm talking about the saints that come in and, we, and, and you scratch your head. They need the love of Jesus too. Amen. Amen. The new believer, the new believer who doesn't understand church jargon or they may not dress the way that we dress. They don't understand what we understand. And Paul is excited because what he's saying is that you have love for all the believers. I think that's a special ingredient that every church should have. When we talk about community and we talk about church growth and we talk about a healthy church, we need to be loving everybody that comes through the door, not just the people that, that, that subscribe to your, to your full theology or dress the the way that you dress or like the same restaurants that you that you like me and Mike are on the opposite sides of the spectrum he likes the Cowboys I'm a 49ers fan but I love that brother we need to love everybody that comes into the church and so Paul he, he, he he's examining something here he says I love your vertical relationship and I love your horizontal relationship. There's something special going on here in the church of Ephesus. And I just believe that God wants all of us to cross over 
on dry ground. I just believe that God wants all of us to cross over the Jordan together. And it's important for us to love each other. Jesus said that they will know you're my disciples by the love that you show one another. Do we love enough to let the crackhead into the church? Do we, do we love enough to let the prostitute in the church? Do we love enough to let the drunkard or the homeless person to come off the street into the church? Do we love enough to love people who have different political views? Do we love enough to love people that don't look like us? Paul picks up on something and he says, I, I, I love the fact that I'm hearing that you have love for all the saints. And, and, and that's a beautiful thing. But Paul, he, he, he's genuinely concerned about the church also. He's genuinely concerned about the church also. And, and, and because Paul knows that, 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 that loving Christ is amazing and, and, and loving your neighbor is amazing. In other words, we, we can have great Sunday experiences, but Paul understands that there's more. Paul's been walking with the Lord Jesus Christ for over 20 years now, and Paul has some experience. He has some wisdom. He has some revelation. He just has this walk. He's been walking with God for some time now. How many of y'all know some seasoned saints that have been walking with God for some time now, and you can just trust the fact that they know God, and if they open up their mouth, there's something that they can tell you. And so Paul, he's genuinely concerned about the church here because Paul understands there's a little something else that you need. There's a little something else that you need in your walk. There's a little something else that you need in your spirituality. I know you love Jesus, and I, and I know you love each other, but can I push you to go a little deeper? He, he's, he's approaching them as an apostolic father in the faith, and, and, and he's genuinely concerned. And, and, and I think he probably goes there, because, I, and, and we'll have to talk about this, I think maybe at some point the Holy Spirit was showing showing him down the line. They're, they're, they, they love Jesus and they love each other, but, but, but the scripture speaks in revelations that somewhere along the line, they, they, they lost that love and, and, and Jesus has an issue for this church. And so I believe that Paul is about to insert some revelation to the church that says it's not just about you loving God right now and you loving one another. There's something else that you need in your life and all Paul could do was pray. He couldn't go back and, and, and lay hands. He couldn't go back and, and cast out devils. He couldn't go back and hold meetings with the elders. Paul's on house arrest. And so all Paul could do was pray. And so the scripture picks up here in verse 16. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that, 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 the, God of, that, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom, may give you the spirit of wisdom. I know you love Jesus, and I know we meet here every Sunday morning, but, but, but I'm asking that God would give you the spirit of wisdom. What is Paul referring to as he, as he speaks of the spirit of wisdom? We see this in 1 Corinthians. Paul is speaking here in chapter 2, verse 6 through 11. I hope I'm not boring anybody on tonight. Can I keep reading? Yet when I was among mature believers, I do not speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind, I, he says, I did speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to the world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak is of the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scripture means when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. See, the religious folks stop right there. But the spiritual folk keep reading. And the verse 10 says, but it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us 
God's deep secrets and shows us God's deep secrets. I know you love God and I know you love each other and, and I can't get to you to put my hands on you, church, but, 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 but the Spirit will search out God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirits. Watch verse 12. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. And so when we read this passage of Scripture in Paul's prayer, Paul is not saying that we don't have the Holy Spirit. He's not writing to the church of Ephesus to suggest that they don't have the Holy Spirit. Paul is asking for a specific manifestation of the Holy Spirit to be evident in the life of the believer. I'm starting to get happy. I was supposed to be teaching on tonight. God has deep secrets and wisdom that he wants to reveal. And Paul is convinced that God wants to reveal it through the church. The church should be the hot spot for innovation in the world. I can't hear nobody. We got all this technology popping up every single day, and the wisdom of God should be coming to the saints. And Paul is praying a prayer, and he's asking that God would give his people special wisdom to look into the future and to know what God wants to do in the earth. Again, Paul had been walking with God for some time now. And so Paul is understanding that there is a depth in God. The scripture makes it clear that the unsearchable wisdom of God. And Paul is trying to push the church into a place where they will not just settle for the fact that they love Jesus and they love each other. He says there is a wisdom that God wants to bring to his church that we can move in power and we can do things that have not been done before. Somebody say amen. amen. We can only receive this spiritual wisdom and, and you have to study it because it's all tied back to identity. It's all tied back to the church and, and, and us as the body Knowing who we are in Christ Jesus, can I let you in on a secret? Secrets are only revealed in the secret place. And so there is secret wisdom that God wants to give to his church. But if you are not in the secret place, and the thing that stops us from going into the secret place is our lack of identity. You are redeemed. You are chosen. You are adopted. And so you can boldly come before the throne of grace. God wants to give his church special spiritual wisdom. But you have to get to the place where you will move into the secret place and say, I know I don't always get it right, but God, I want some spiritual wisdom. Say amen. And so Paul is praying to the church, and he says that may God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We looked at this word revelation before. It simply means to uncover or to unveil which that, that which was previously hidden. This is not man doing research. It don't work like that. This is not man doing research. This is something that God had hidden that through the Spirit of God is now being unveiled for a certain time, for a certain season, for what God wants to do in the earth. And Paul is saying, church, there is spiritual wisdom and there is spiritual revelation. There's some things that God has hidden. That in August of 2024, God wants to unveil to his church. And so Paul is praying 
for the church that the church would have spiritual revelation in the knowledge of him. So when you know him, you know self. Peter's spiritual revelation of who Jesus was unveiled his purpose. Y'all got to hear this. Peter's spiritual revelation of who Jesus was unveiled his purpose in the earth. Jesus said to him, flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but it had been revealed to you from my father who was in heaven. So what we have to understand is that spiritual revelation is what allows heaven to invade earth. And so Paul is saying, God, I'm praying for this church that I labored in. I'm praying for this church that I planted all the people that he's thinking about, all the devils he casted out, all of the people that he sold into, all of the people that he prayed for. And he's saying, God, give them spiritual wisdom and give them spiritual revelation because I know there's more you want to do in their life. This is not a Google search. This is a heavenly search engine that God has given us access to. But we have to go into the secret place knowing that our identity is sure in God, knowing that he will receive us. Spiritual revelation. And then he prays. He says he double downs on it. He says, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. What does that mean? And it means no darkness in your understanding, that, that, that nothing's hidden from your spiritual eyesight. That word understanding simply, simply breaks down to mean deep thought and enlightenment mean made to see or bring to light. And, and God wants to bring us to the place where we know the deep thoughts that are in the mind of God. God wants us to know what he is thinking and what he wants to do right now in the earth. And, 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 and I, have to, I have to circle back to this. I was, I was talking to pastor in the back. I have to circle back to this thought here because this here is, 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 is one of the most eloquent prayers in the scripture that Paul's praying. It's, it's one of the most targeted prayers that the apostle was praying. It's, it's one of the most, most quoted prayers that the apostle was praying. And, and, and I believe that it came from the heart of God. I believe that it was in, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that if the church would, would, would walk in it, that, that, that she would move for, forward in, in, in her purpose. But, but Paul's prayer for the church of Ephesus and his prayer for us today was simply his desire. And we would, and some of us would ask the question, why would he pray that prayer? And I would suggest because Paul knows that there's more. But I don't think the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, why did he pray the prayer? I think the question that the church and each of every one of us who are here need to be asking ourselves is, what do you desire? Because Paul could pray all day for the church. But the question that's being asked tonight, church, is what do you desire? Because it's the prayer that can change everything. But is it what you desire for your life? I know it's tight, but it's right. What do you desire? Because God wants to download revelation. God wants to download his thoughts into the earth. The spirit confirms in our spirit. We cry out, Abba, Father. The scripture says... We have, we have the Spirit of God. We 
We have the Spirit of God. We have His Spirit. So, so, so what is in your life that is hindering God from talking to Himself? We, ha we have the Spirit of God. We have His, his Spirit. I know, we, I know we in flesh. I know we, we in this earth, and, 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 and there's, there, there's layers of, of, of earth and, 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 and all types of just that, that can be in the way. But, but, but what is in the way of the Spirit of God speaking to the Spirit of God? What do we desire on tonight, church? I know what he desires. But what do we desire? If your desire is, Lord, I want more of your spirit. I want a spirit of wisdom to rest on me. I want a spirit of revelation to come upon me like it came upon Peter. There was nothing special about that man. the revelation that the Father had in heaven hit the earth through a man. And Jesus confirmed that wasn't flesh and blood. It wasn't you. This, 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 this is not man. This is heaven invading earth. This is the mind of God. And that, that's what the Lord wants to do in each and every one of our lives. So Paul spent all this time building us up in this new identity only for us to go further. Because Paul has spent years and years and time and time building the kingdom and walking with God and, and being shipwrecked and being built and built beat and going through the process of, of walking with the Father. And he came to this revelation. Ephesus it's great that you love Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. It's great that you love each other. But you got to watch now. Because if you don't move in spiritual wisdom and spiritual revelation, you'll just be having church. And one day, you'll look up and you'll be lukewarm. Let's stand, church. If that's your desire on tonight, just lift your hands. Just lift your hands. Let's just go before the Father. With no shame, with no guilt, with no condemnation, we're all free in Christ Jesus. We bless you, Father. We count it a privilege to be your church on tonight, Father. We thank you for meeting us here on tonight, Father. We thank you for your word on tonight, Father. Holy Spirit, we thank you for meeting us on tonight. Before I take my seat, I just pray over everyone under the sound of my voice. Lord, we ask that you would give us spiritual wisdom and revelation. Lord, we just don't want to live a casual Christian life, God. Lord, but you sent us here to do a work to expand your kingdom. And we are the glorious church. And so, Lord, we say use us. And God, we commit on tonight to get anything out of the way that would stop you from speaking to your spirit that you have placed on the inside of us, God. We lift off every weight, God, every sin, God, anything that would try to stop us, God, from, from, from getting into that secret place, Lord. 
and we open up ourselves unto you, Lord. And so I thank you, God, that even right now, Lord, there's spiritual downloads, God, that are coming to your people. There's wisdom and revelation, God, that's coming to your people, Lord, that will preserve generations, Father that will birth revivals, Father, that will birth economies in the name of Jesus, Lord. Have your way in our life, God, for your glory's sake, God. We give you all the praise and all the honor, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for humbling yourself, Christ Jesus. We thank you for, 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 for allowing us to sit with you in heavenly places. Father, we thank you for uniting us in Christ. Glory to your name, Father. Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Put your hands together, church. Come on, put your hands together, church. Hey, man, you know, Pastor Nick, this is rich. Um, you know, I was thinking while you were talking, I was like, you're, you're, you're dealing with this prayer of the Apostle Paul, and it's a fatherly prayer. It's an apostolic prayer, and I was thinking about, gosh, I wish my dad was here right now, and if I could have him do anything, because he passed away almost three years ago, if I could have him do anything, I'd just have him ask him to pray for me. I was thinking about the founders of this church. I was trying to give you some weight, understanding what we have going on with this scripture. He's dealing with Pastor Terry, who's was here right now. If he only could do one thing, he could just stand here and just pray over you. Understand the weight of the words of what he's reading here with the Apostle Paul. This is a fatherly prayer. I, I encourage you, go back and read chapter 1 again. And take this in because there's a weightiness... There's a weight in the words of what he's talking to this church. There's these words to the church. You know, that, that, that word enlightened. Sorry, I'll give you some Greek. <laughs> Photon, fotizo, fotizo, enlighten. You said it. it. It means, it doesn't mean to, I have a flashlight in my hand or a candle in my hand or a lantern in my hand and I come to you and I bring you light. It actually means I meet you in your darkness and I bring you to the light. And so I believe God's bringing his church. There, you know, in the book of Job, it says in chapter 38, it says, there's a question. It says, who has darkened your counsel? There's certain things that we just don't see. And God wants to bring us to light. He wants to bring us to wisdom and to revelation and 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 thank you because you you did your homework and you poured out here tonight this is powerful there's a weightiness that's being released in this room